Greetings from Upper Dense, Michigan. We got a snowy day. It's pretty cold out. Snow's fallen. So we ain't got spring yet. But hopefully soon. So let me see if I got any messages. I still not figured out how to trees or antennas, German grower. Anyways. Get that back there in a little bit. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, being prepared. Pete, how you doing? I wanted to give some tips on uh, being prepared and you know things I've learned over the years. And I want to start off with uh, how I found a way to keep bugs out of your rice and wheat and beans, etc. You know, when you put a five-gallon bucket of rice or oatmeal or um, flour away, there's a tendency for uh, bugs to get into it after a while. And the cure to that is either you get dry ice and put a small piece of dry ice in the bucket and close the lid. That takes all the oxygen out of it. And a lot of times, I've done this in Belize when I was in Central America with uh, a gallon jars, glass gallon jars. Start a piece of paper on fire, start burning, and drop it in, close the lid, and that fire takes the oxygen out of the, the air in here. And the bugs, they can't hatch or live in, the, in an environment with no oxygen. So the beetles and the worms and everything die. Um, just keep that in mind. It's a, if you don't have dry ice, dry ice will do the same thing. You can you can use a, a piece of dry ice it's, and cl close the lid quickly. As long as there's no air coming in, it will keep the bugs from hatching out. I, one time I got on a trip to Bolivia. My rice, my beans, my flour, and I think even the popcorn. When I got back, it was full of bugs. I was gone for like eight weeks. So... Uh, Belize, uh, the rate of uh, spillage with, by bugs it was high compared to America. So anybody got any questions? I'll uh, try to answer what I can. We'll talk about, uh, let's see. I'm trying to see. It's really, for some reason, I have a hard time figuring this chat out. How I know or how to, how to know. Do you know if you can make a glowstone glow more? Ben Byron, fish black outside. Um, glowstone. I'm not sure. I've been I've been trying to figure out, and I'm curious about this. When radiation, electromagnetic like electromagnetic radiation hits a fluorescent bulb, it will glow, and what is the contents of the fluorescent bulb? Is it phosphorus? If anybody knows, uh, right, tell me in the chat. <clears throat> well, the way things are going in this world, I feel like we're in for uh, troubled times. If you look back through history, the world goes in cycles. Why at times get, get easy and people get rich and they get lazy. And then things get hard. And then it gets rough, and it goes in a cycle. And all through history, we've had these cycles, and I think we're coming into another one. At this point, people have gotten quite rich, life is easy, and they're gotten lazy. Too dependent on others to survive. I was reading an old history book years ago that um, in the er before the Middle Ages, we're going back to tribal days, in Europe, the Celts and the Germans. Tribes used to uh, work together, a tribal area, and each each person had their own house. And what they would do is they would they'd make a stash of food away from the house. They would hide it, like a hole or a cave or a hidden spot where they would hide their food. And the reason they did that because if raiders came through, oftentimes they would hit the house and take what food they had, 
and then they could fall back on the survival food. And as people were usually too too lazy to go looking for the stash, I mean, it, pretty much everybody had them. And I think nowadays we've gotten so used to an easy life, we don't we don't think about that. But um, when our house burned down, it made me realize when you got all your preps in one place, how quickly they could disappear, either in fire or you know, through robbers coming in and taking them. And it, it, it is a smart idea to have another place where you keep food so you can survive. Um, food's an important, important, important thing, food and water. <clears throat> My, um, when you grow your own food, it's, um, important to it properly. And, uh, I've, uh, been trying over the years to, uh, learn different ways to preserve food better. And like potatoes, pretty easy to store in a cool, dry place. Um, carrots you pack in sand. I've tried to do carrots and beets without putting them in sand, but unless you put them uh, root crops in sand, they shrivel up. So I did notice beets, if they're kept wet, will last a lot longer. Um, without canning, you can just keep the beets in, in a sack, keep it slightly damp, and they seem to, seem to do pretty well. But carrots, they either rot or dry up, shrivel up. And I think the best option is to pack them in sand, uh, damp sand in, in, a, in a cool place. Uh, potatoes, on the other hand, I, as long as they don't freeze, you keep, keep them slightly dry. Go maybe once or twice in the winter, check them, take out the rotten ones, pick off the, uh, the sprouts that are coming on, and keep, and keep them in the dark. That's, that's, that's important. If they get light, they'll turn green and they'll start to grow. And that, that's... I don't like the taste of green potatoes. They ain't good. Um, I've had uh, I've had issues with cabbage. I still haven't figured out uh, uh, the best way to store cabbage. I've tried different methods. I've tried burying them. I've tried just hanging them from the, from strings. I've tried uh, um, leaving the roots on and leaving them in the basement. And so far, I've never found a good method to store cabbage very well. It seems that it always it wants to dry out. And wants to rot on me so anybody got any tips on that let me know i'm i'm wanting to want more cabbage storage oh, you can make sa sauerkraut but the reason i want to store cabbage is because when you, if you you need cabbage seed you need a second year plant beets carrot cabbage and um those things take two years to get seed and so to get seed you got to replant it the next year and that's my main reasons for wanting to store cabbage over and i had a uh, last year rutabagas i did good on they did pretty well and carrots are, aren't that hard that's some good carrot seed last year um when you do carrot seed keep in mind that you want to keep the, the wild carrots the queen annie's lace cut down around because it will cross with your to your tame carrots and, ma and make your carrots sour well head goats are in cabbage fermenting it yeah, that's been my problem too, Pete. And I, I wanted to save it for so I could grow it for seed. And that was the main reason. Um, this year it looks like I'm gonna I have a few few heads that made it made it through, but they're they're looking kind of rough, like usual. And I'm wondering if it's uh, I never tried uh, waxing them. Maybe that would help keep them drying out because it seemed like they they had a tendency to dry out, even though and if you get them too wet they rot, which that's not fun. Um, we had, uh, let's see, I'll show you guys our weather today. Yeah, we got snow. No sap flow today, I don't think, or not much of it. Yesterday we had a pretty good run of sap, and then today it just, it got too cold. Um... I was trying to say, think of, um, I think the one of the smartest ways to do, to live is to grow your own food. That way you know what's in it. You know, there's, you know it's been, been growing good. Snowing cold here too, very windy. We don't have much wind here, Pete. We got some snow. It's very, very, very quiet out. Um, I was going to say the... Uh, 
I, I think growing your own food is one of the best things because you know what's in it and what's been it's, it's, it's organic. I mean, you go to the store, you don't know what to say. Well, you know what's in that food. It could be sprays, chemicals, additives, preservatives. And it's surprising the amount of uh, chemicals they use on, on produce. When I was in Belize, the guys who go to produce, they'd spray every week. And that way, the, the, there's no bugs on the food. I mean, the food looks good, but there's a, the, the bugs are dead, and, and there's a, most likely residue from the spray in the food. We had um, the problem is when you go to market with vegetable holes, people say, oh, they don't want it. People don't realize that oftentimes when, when a vegetable looks good, it ain't good for you. But uh, so I want to talk about uh, being prepared. And I think one of the big issues most people will have is food. We need to make sure we uh, have a food supply and grow our own food. <clears throat> I think it's good uh, to try to live in a way that you know, is rotating your food, keeping it rotated. Um, rice is a pretty cheap thing you can buy. I've raised rice before, but never here in Michigan. And uh, here in Michigan, we have an issue whenever we raise grain, birds want to eat it. I'll tell you, I always thought, you know, back in the old days, we don't realize how much, if you depend on, if you depend on your own grown food, it's, it's, a, it's a battle against the birds and the bugs and um, the weather sometimes. But um, thank God for good crops we do get. I, I really kind of wonder sometimes if, if some of the plants we plant now aren't as strong as they used to be. Because it seems like the bugs just, certain years, the bugs just really go on the plants. And it, if you don't spray, and I, I, like I said, I use a Tresor Organic. And the best spray I found for use, you to use for uh, soft bite insects is sugar and soap. So you take a gallon of water, a cup of sugar, and a, a tablespoon of soap, and you mix them together and you spray that and it, it, directly on the bug and it will kill them. They can't stand the sugar and the soap. And it's very effective against most all soft bodied insects. Now, hard bodied insects, it's a little different. They don't die, it's easy. And I think it's important we have our own, own seed supply. I've been saving seeds for years and um, I try to keep the varieties pure so they don't cross. That takes a little bit, a little effort to, to make sure you don't plant too close together or you tarp them or screen them so they don't get crossed by bees. Or you can hand pollinate like squash. Now, what I found is most beans do not cross pollinate. So you, for me, I've had very little issue with beans cross pollinating as long as they plant about 25 feet apart. They would stay stay pure type, true to type, and uh, but sweet corn, it, uh, corn and sweet corn in general is, is very very apt to cross pollinate. So if you have a, a field of corn, and anywhere around in the area, winds blowing, and uh, I was for me, I think one of the best ways for corn is to plant in. Um, uh, in patches when you plant your corn do, don't plant in rows because what happens when the wind blows it blows the pollen away and if you plant the patch it, it's it pollinates better so plant in blocks like in a, in a 10 foot block rather than a two or three foot row what happens like i said the wind the pollen will oftentimes blow away you get less pollination so if you plant those that corn into a block it, it's it's a better all-around pollination when pollinated, or you can take a, a paper bag and put it over the tassel, and shake the pollen into it, and then put it on the, uh, the silks yourself. It's more a uh, time consuming method, but it works. Um, over the years, growing um, different kinds of corn, and uh, there was a corn, and I've st this still always confused me because normally when you take corn, if you put them close to get in close proximity to each other, 
they'll cross. And there was this uh, corn that the Amish had, a red-eared corn, and they would plant it in with the red, the yellow field corn every year. And it didn't matter how many years in a row you kept doing it, it never seemed to lose its red color. And I was really amazed by that. Normally, I think if you put it with yellow, it would cross. So I started, I tried some, of took some of this red corn, and I replanted it to see what happened. <coughs> and it, it come out red. And maybe, I'd say 10% had a, a slight bit of yellow in it. That's just purely red. And I still have never figured out why did that particular corn not cross. Either it was flowering at a different time, or there was something about it that was uh, had the ability to stay red, even being planted in a yellow cornfield. Yeah, it's uh, it was husking time. The kids like to find those red, the red ears. And um, I guess back in the, in the day, that was a, uh, a fun thing in the uh, husking uh, husking bees they used to have. But um, so to be prepared for hard times, I think it's important we have seeds. We grow our own seeds and try to grow varieties that are, are how would you say it? Area. If you grow your own seed, you're going you're to be able to develop a variety that's good for your area. You'll know it works in your area. If you order from a company, a lot of the seeds are grown in, uh, in warm areas and you bring them to a cold area and they don't do very well. The same with the soil. I think the seeds get um, they adapt to the soil they're planted in. Well, any questions you guys have got? I can't see. I wish somehow I could pull these chat messages up so I could read them. I, I've never figured that out yet. Every time I go to read them, they disappear. <clears throat> but one of these days, I hope they'll figure it out. Aside from food wells, do you think we should step up for sort of hard times? Okay, so I, I think in my mind, a, a really important item is salt. Because if you think about it, I mean, we use salt in a lot of things. We use it in meat. We use it for tanning hides. We use it for flavor uh, food. And, and salt... Unless you got a salt mine close by or live by the coast, it'll be hard to get. It's heavy, and it's uh, in this area. We we don't have a lot of salt. I mean, it's, I don't know if we have any salt. Um, they say at one time in some areas salt was has much worse gold, <coughs> and it's just the uh, salt is something I think we should you should all store. Um, for one, you'll need it. You can bar, use it for a bar item. And I think uh, what I try to do is um, a lot of people say sugar, but I have such an, a dislike for sugar because I find it to be uh, unhealthy. I mean, mo a lot of the health problems today in this world are tied back to too much sugar in the in the diet. And it's, it's not healthy. It's not good for you. I mean, I'm not saying I don't eat sugar, but I can definitely tell you that um, growing up, we didn't eat sugar. I, I'm glad my mother was particular about that because I know I think it helped us a lot. I didn't even have a cavity till I was 21. I feel like sugar is, uh, in many ways, uh, it's an unnecessary item. I'd say a lot of people say, "Oh, store sugar." Well, you want to be healthy, and to be healthy, hi, manic gummies. How you doing? You want to be healthy, and I think in hard times especially, it's important we stay healthy. So I would say don't eat a lot of sugar <laughs> and get used to it now. You know, don't, don't, don't drink Coke. Don't drink Pepsi. Stay away from processed foods. You'll be healthier for it, and I think it will pay off in the long run. Our bodies, uh, we need all kinds of minerals and vitamins, but there's one thing we don't need, and that's sugar. Our body can produce sugar and need some starch. We don't have to actually eat it to survive, so I'd say, yeah, store salt, but for, for health reasons, stay away from the sugar, unless you want to give it to your neighbors. I feel bad for them. 
no maple syrup and honey, I think it's a whole different, whole different subject or maybe natural sugar, but you get into like corn syrup, <coughs> high fructose corn syrup, but corn syrup is extremely dangerous. And I would advise just staying away from it. I am no sugar. I'm diabetic. Yeah. A lot of people I knew had, uh, had sugar that was bothering them. Couldn't eat it. Um, and overall, I think being healthy is important because if you aren't healthy, you can't work, you can't, you can't do what you need to do and you get sick up more likely. <clears throat> well, we caught a, our whole, the whole family caught some kind of cough. I'm not sure what we'd call it. Hope we get over it soon. Everybody's coughing. Well, right now, everybody's in bed and sleep, so <laughs> nap time. Yep, we got maple syrup going here, too. We got some cooking right now yesterday um i don't think it's running today but it should uh hopefully we'll have some warm weather this this spring's been kind of uh strange we get nice sunny days too it's but it's too cold the sap don't run and days that the sap does actually run it's too not that sunny so or it's, when it's warmer it's not sunny so we're getting a lot of uh, it's the first it's my favorite friend i'm blowing set so you guys had a pretty good run then for a week. Yeah, we had a, a really good run yesterday, I thought, but about our first first we had a really good run was yesterday. Well, we've been getting some every day, but not like not like I was hoping for. Um what I was thinking is if I would advise if you don't have a root cellar or a nice basement to build one, because that, that's one thing that it's really important, I think, for uh, storing root crops, potatoes, and carrots. You can keep, keep your uh, some kind of lots of squash down there too, on shelves. Your canned goods. Three to six inches come tonight. Oh, I'm not sure how much we're going to get. Um, in the old days, when uh, someone would buy a place, a farm, or they'd move to the country, one of the first things they used to do was build a root cellar. Um, and nowadays you go to a lot of the old farmsteads, you'll still find them root cellars they built. And uh, I have always said a root cellar is a very important part of life because it's, it, it's a place to store your food. It keeps it cool, keeps the pests out. And uh, also they use them as, as storm shelters. So like in Missouri, when the tornadoes would go through, the people would go to the root cellar. I had an old neighbor tell me a story when he was a boy that, Trailer had gone through and they had gone to the cellar to, to get out, get away. And they watched their house go up, up into the air. Tornado took it up and one piece and it was way up there. It started to break to pieces. And they, they sat in the storm, the storm, the, in the root cellar and watched it. And he said, Boy, that was a, something to see. The whole house gone. And then the neighbor next to us, their house had uh, also blown down in a, in a storm and they got in their cellar. So, cellar can be good for more than one thing. You, you, your life might depend on it if you're in the Midwest. I mean, here, I don't think we have many tornadoes, but when you're in tornado country, then it's, a, it's a good thing to have uh, or a good basement. I mean, the thing is with a basement, if, you're, if your uh, roof blows off, you're still going to get a lot of water. Where the, with a storm, with a cellar, your roof's already, you know, don't have a roof, your roof's already covered over with dirt. So you're better off in that sense. I need to I need to build another one. I mean, we have a nice space, but it, it it's uh, I either need to remake it like a cellar, or build a separate separate place, so that I have to be a little more uh, strong, we should say. Yeah. So first, so I have seeds. Keep your seeds. Um, another thing I think this would be good to keep to do is uh, store store the herbs you need. Um, keep dried herb on hand. Uh, peppermint, uh, comfrey is good for bones, sore, sore muscles, broken bones. Um, keep chickweed on hand for skin problems. If you keep uh, chickweed leaves, or you could use uh, plantain for skin skin, skin issues. 
have you built a root cellar to a hill? I never have. I've actually seen, I've seen a few built into a hill before. Um, most of the ones in the Midwest when I was growing up that I always saw, they were they were just built into the ground. They would take a section of the area and dig a hole, build the cellar. Uh, yes, Medina Farm, question about horses. Uh, dig a hole and then just cover it with the dirt they dug the hole. So it would stick up a little bit out of the ground, slight mound. And um, it wasn't very pretty, I guess. Once you house, didn't they build their farms on hills. Um, oh, burdock's another good herb you need to keep on hand for burns. Um, do you have any, and those burdock leaves really, really are good for burning. Put them on, put them over the hand, and wrap it. And it, the, the burdock is really healing for burns, infection out. Okay, so your horse not winding back. I've had that issue before. A lot of times, <laughs> yes, comfort is very good. So what I did, when I, usually when I had a horse that didn't want to back, now there, there's more than one way to do it, but one way I always, I always would do is take the horse out, don't put it in the buggy, and you just take a small stick and you, and you get to back, 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 and you keep saying back, back. Back. And a lot of times I noticed that a horse, it, if when you pull when you pull a bit, they, they fight and they want to go forward. So you want to teach the horse to back, not necessarily just by pulling the bit, but by the by the command to back. If, if you get if you can get them to if, if to follow a command to back, and then just go real light on the bit because your horse might be fighting a bit, and maybe it's not, it's pushing onto the bit. So it, that could be part of the problem. And then another thing I do sometimes is uh, take and put a draft horse next to him, and then have the and then back the draft horse up and, and pull him back that way, and that that'll help him learn to uh, back up. But and I've I've tried the heel thing, you know, stop on a heel and get him to back on a heel. Um, don't like it very much because sometimes the buggy will start to go the wrong direction. Um, and I I, I don't like to take a, a small a young horse onto a, a steep hill anyhow in case it adds up but there was a, co a couple times i tried that for never for much impressive it i i'd say the main thing with some horses is they always go against pressure there, there's, a, there's a tendency for some horses to do that so when you when you can get them to learn to back up without pulling those lines too hard just a slight a little bit and then let go and then say back they'll move back yeah, the bit too. They're fighting the bit probably. <clears throat> that was my issue. I'd say that you get a hot-headed horse. They don't. They don't want to um, listen to the bit. Mm. Try to train them on the ground. You call the command to back. That's what I always did. And then once I had that, you put them in the buggy and you say back, and they they would back up. So, um, now I mean I've had horses. That wouldn't back up. I had one horse in particular, and it was my first horse I ever had, was in gelding. Um, he, I never did get him to back very well. He would, I could back him a few steps and he would stop. And I had never had been able to get that horse to back properly. And that was back, I don't know, 25 years ago. And he, uh, he always, I'd have to, I'd have to take him to the buggy, and you know, get him under the shaft. He didn't, he didn't like to swing under the shafts like he was supposed to, so I would have him stand there. I'd pull the buggy up to him because he would, he, I couldn't, I couldn't swing or back him in. He was so stubborn. But over the years, I figured out ways to get around that. Um, started training horses, and then in horse training, you'll you'll see the different different attitudes horses have. Some horses seem to respond to pressure. And some fight against pressure. If you got a horse fighting pressure, then you'll want to teach them. Um, like, for example, when you're training balkers, a lot of times people don't realize that they'll take a whip and they'll try to whip it and the horse will back up. Well, don't whip the horse. Uh, what I used to do is I would get off and I'd go to the head of the horse. And there's three things I did that, that seemed to work. One, Take a syringe and spray water in the ear. 
well, that would irritate them and they take off. So then you could just make sure you're ready to jump on the buggy. You grab them lines or you hold them lines. And when the horse take off, you just jump on the buggy. And then another thing I did was uh, take gravel. And I did it a couple of times with, with, um, with uh, oil. And so I'm just, just gravel, put the gravel in the horse's mouth. And they did there. It kind of got him a little irritated, didn't like it. And then they took off. And another way was um, the most extreme method, which also worked for the worst of balkers. When I, I mean, I used to train balkers for Amish guys because I, I had a name for training balkers. People were like, okay, yeah, he, he can train balkers. So they bring their balking horses. Um, another method was you took, you took a, a, take the ear and you, you take one of the small vice grips and just, just set it so that it was, uh, tight, but not too tight that it would stay on the ear, but it wouldn't actually, uh, cut the ear. You'd snap it on the ear and then the horse would take off. So you normally anything on the head and they push against it. But if you try it on the back end, they just back up into you. So it was, it was an interesting thing I found with horses that, they would respond to the head and they would go forward. Otherwise it was back. <laughs> and then another thing I used to do is I had a long whip. And if I would just hit the tops of their ears, just the top of the ears with the whip, and then it would take off. But yeah, with balkers, you, you definitely want to focus on their head because they're, they're, they're wired backwards. So the normal horse, you, you tap it on the back, it goes forward. Well, a balker, you tap on the back and it goes backwards. So, I don't. I don't like a balker. Although I've I've trained a lot of them over the years, just for the fact that people have a hard time dealing with them, so I end up with a lot of them. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh, oh, I was gonna say the. Um, I've had with seeds. Uh, a way I've learned, I learned to keep my seeds in jars. And when our house fire happened, this the, it, it taught me again a lesson because I had some of the seeds in plastic bags and some of the seeds in jars. The seeds in plastic bags, regardless of whether they got burned or not, got water. So plastic bags didn't work. But the jars, I still had seeds in jars that made it through. Um, I don't know how burn, badly burned. Good afternoon, David, everybody. Hi, hey, Jerome. <clears throat> yeah, we had um so I say store your seeds in jars. Keep them in a jar. They always say you shouldn't keep beans in an airtight container, but I I, I store my beans in jars and seem to always have been able to grow them afterwards. Um seeds I had the hardest time with were onion seeds. Onion seeds and chives, the, the life the life of seed isn't very long, so you want to keep uh, replanting them. So you have fresh seed. Some seeds like tomatoes, they'll, they'll last a long time. Yeah, that's a very destructive thing. <laughs> oh, you know, I was going to talk about something. You know, this CB, CBDC issue that we're seeing with the, the people, the government working on the CBDC, central bank digital currencies. Um, I was listening to George Gammon, and I, I like George because he he digs into the, the the little small parts of things we don't think about, and he was pointing out that they don't have to change the currency to make a CBDC, and what he was what he was pointing out is that the, the small banks that are collapsing right now, and the, that are going bust, he said the Fed takes on that bank and takes on their balance sheet, it becomes part of the Fed's balance sheet. And so what's happening is all the banks are consolidating into a few central banks under the Fed. Once the Fed has all those banks under its control, he said they could, they could even in a CBDC, and the only, only, the only thing they need is on buying end, whether you use cash or card or whatever, as long as the store is keeping track of who spent what and who and where. And if you think about it, how many stores do you go to that have rewards programs? I mean, you go to Track Supply, they got a rewards program. They want your number, and they want your name, and they want your address, and they want to track your purchases. Um, about all the hardware stores you go to, same thing. 
grocery stores, same thing. The apps you use, buying apps. What's happened, the more they track your purchases, they can, if they can centralize the data with the with the bank data or with your purchase data, they don't have to change the currency to control things. They just have to make sure they have the data of where the money is being spent and by, by whom. <coughs> so when you go into a store and you give them your rewards card, what's basically happening is they're keeping track of what you buy and you know how much money you spend. People say, well, the, how can the government get a hold of that? Well, most of these big corporations, they have uh, databases. And the database, they keep track of all the different uh, purchases. Now, at this point, to have a, a truly working CBDC, there would have to be a, a partnership between the corporations and the government. Because even if the Fed had all the people's money, time dealing, running the system without having the retail side of it, um, doing their part. And at this point, it looks like as we'll see most retailers are already keeping track of who buys what in the store. Um, and some people said, we, we, we back out of the store by the hand. She'll back out of the store by hand in the buggy, but, she, but in the buggy, she won't even try. <coughs> yeah, did you, uh, Medina, Medina um, did you try um, tie, or hitching her with a draft horse and then teaching her back in a wagon? If you try that, it might help. Get her with a big horse that she can't push around and then have that big horse back up with her. And so on with this, what I was, my thoughts is, um, it, it, he was saying that, well, we'll wake up. Do I have any rewards and not sign up? I don't have a phone number. I tend to push it with the plane close to Yeah, for me, the same thing. They, the, a lot of times what they do at Tractor Supply, they just enter another number because it seems like they almost have to have it, seems like. When you want to buy something, they, they just put in, a, they put, I guess they put in their, their store's number or their number. I don't know what they put in. But they don't don't put my number in, and I've always wondered. I think it'd be best if we want to stay out of that system, is not to engage in those um, rewards programs because that is that is one of the steps that is needed to complete the dominant or the, the money control circle. It's the uh, the banks, centrally controlled banks or centrally controlled ledgers, we should say, and then. A controlled retail end, and so it seems like if you look at the way the system works, if those two work together, then they can kind of track and, and trace pretty much every transaction. Now, if if a company isn't on that system, that company you could you could uh, spend cash and they they would never never know where it went. But if you if you give them your number, then obviously they're going to know who it is. I mean, it's pretty hard to have a phone these days that isn't, isn't tied to you know you have to give your ID when you come in I don't know if you can still get flip phones that are probably a pre prepaid flip phone are getting, are getting hard to find they like to they like when you go in to show your ID and then um, that way they know who it is and I, I think personally I'm almost sure the phone's listening to you and I'm sure they can see you because um, I've been talking about something before, and then right after, as I'm or as I'm talking, ads pop up trying to sell me the product I'm talking about, or or if I'm talking about bank loan, automatically I get bank loan advertisements, uh, you know, right away. So yeah, I think I think the Google listens. Driver license is chipped, huh? Well, I don't have a driver's license anymore. I let mine run out, so, and I'm not planning on getting another one, so. Um, I feel like it's uh, the whole system is rigged in my in my in my thought process is that it's rigged it's a rigged control system and the less they know about you and what you're doing I think it's better that way they don't have the ability to trace everything you're doing what you're doing phone is obviously traced I'm sure but um, I, I I personally uh, I wish I could get rid of my phone but 
it's kind of the only way I interact with other people at this time, besides the Amish. And uh, no, in the future, I hope I hope to have more people I can deal with around us that are, that are, that are um, living a, in a way that's uh, sustainable life, so to say. I'm trying to think. Um, on, on, on being prepared, I, I think one thing a lot of people should keep in mind is that, like, no, what to, but we'll have to be able to make a home base income. Yeah, the, um, I mean, personally, I think if you live in a way where you produce all your own food and most of your own items, it's not, it's not expensive to live. I mean, if you can produce your food, that's a big, that's a big step in becoming independent and, um, food with your food production. If you can grow your own seeds, raise your own animals, have your own milk and your own eggs, I mean, you can, you can live pretty well without, um, a whole lot of expenses. I mean, our biggest, our biggest expense is taxes. And I, uh, I, I don't like taxes. I, I've always wished somehow I could figure out a way to do that. But so far we're living in corporations and the corporations where our land is, I guess if we don't pay our tax, they'll kick us off. So I, yeah, property taxes. That's my biggest uh, problem. Cause I have to, I have to really struggle to get them paid sometimes because I don't make enough cash to cover them very easily. Um, and this summer or this coming year, one of my main goals is I want to try to work on growing my own feed, my own animal feed for the animals, the chickens and the, the cow and the pigs. So I don't have to buy grain. Um, Cause my biggest, my biggest thing that I spend money on is grain uh, feed for the animals. Because for us, our personally, we don't we don't use that much. We don't buy that much from the store for us. So it's 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 uh, our bills low. But then you get the chicken feed, uh, some some grain for the cow, and um, what well, we we buy cat food and dog food too. Which we got too many cats, but it's nice to have cats for the most part. They keep all the mice and rats going. Um, Yeah, I was thinking, uh, I was listening to George talking about how people always think a, a CBDC is going to be a different currency. He said, actually, it doesn't necessarily have to be a different currency. He said, they could use the dollar, but just uh, they could make that uh, everybody's accounts are tied to the Fed. And that way, there would be a central, a central control on, the, on, the, on the, bank, the banking system. So... It's kind of it's kind of a tricky th thought to think about that we're all looking for a different currency when in reality it could still be the U.S. dollar that they use, but just centralize it instead of lo local banks. I mean, if the banks all go broke and bail them out or take them in. That would take care of it, wouldn't it? Um, let's see. Live chat. So, Miss, how do you make the chat? Do you know? You hit the live chat button. Whatever I do, nothing happens. All I get is just. Uh... Okay, I popped up. So, back out of the stall by hand, but not in the bogus you won't even try. Huh. That's the last. Yeah, the snow's really coming down here. It's hard to say how much we'll end up with. We'll find out, I guess. I think we're getting close to a half inch now. How about home farm protection defense? What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's important. I um, went our house and I lost all my guns, most for the most part. So uh, I did get, I got 22 again, but no, all my good guns burned. Uh, oh boy, when the house went up, he, he, it sounded like a, a gun range or something bullets going off. <laughs> we had, I had all, I had all the bullets inside the uh, army metal army um, boxes, 
Well, but that's one thing I'd say. If you, if you do have a lot of guns and ammo, store them, store them somewhere else besides your house, at least most of them, because if you lose your house, you lose all your ammo. So it'd be nice, or at least at least make it a fireproof box or something, because when um, the the I, the canisters I had them in, you can look at the uh, well, canisters. A lot of them just melted, blew up in the canister inside the canisters, and the black powder I had blew the side of the wall off, like a bomb. I had about thirty pounds of black powder, and it it blew the whole side of the house off. That's how, and it was inside one of those metal uh, army canisters. Yeah, I think uh, one thing about um, defense, houses of yelling distance from each other, it helps. Um, a lot of people say they want to live in some remote area, but in some ways, if uh, roaming bandits are out looking for trouble, they avoid more um, or closer settled areas. Like in Belize, in, those, in, this, in Central America, when those Mennonite communities – when they build their communities, they always build the uh, the main area of the houses. They put the houses within yelling distance of each other. And what that did, they put a house here and they went across the road a little further down and then. And that way they, they were all within, in uh, close close to proximity to each other. And it helped with for, with robbers because robbers weren't so apt to it, say the house was out in the bush somewhere. All, oftentimes robbers would target the lone houses and they would it's safer. And another thing they did is in the community, they made their own money, their own currency, and they would just use that. So if the robbers came, the currency, and they took, the currency would be of no value to them because they, they couldn't spend it anywhere else except inside the Mennonite community. I thought it was a smart idea to do that, um, to use their own currency. They had, they had their own bills. Um, I don't know. And some of them had their own banks, too. I don't, I, they made their own banks, so to say. Um, I've always wondered... Uh, the way they did it, it, it really made it hard for robbers to get much unless, unless they just took things in general. Uh, now the Mennonites were non-resistant; they didn't believe in fighting, so they wouldn't have had uh, they wouldn't have defended their place with guns. But they they were they built the houses so they could lock the doors well and the windows, and that way it was hard hard to enter. And they they made it uh, the bar the doors could bolts on. I mean a lot of, a lot of today's doors. A lot of people don't realize they they put a window in the door or a window next to the door, and all robbers got to do is come up and break that window, and they can go right into your house. You just open the door and walk in. Um, I would say when you build your house, don't put windows next to doors, and if you do have windows, put put uh, inside shutters where they can be shut. Um, the oak shutters that you can shut the shut the windows, because if you think about it, the old European houses they all were built like little castles. They were built to, for, for, for protection and defense. They, they were built for strength. Even the wooden ones, I mean, they had shutters on every window. Um, their doors were, were heavy doors, sturdy. <laughs> and uh, nowadays, when you build a house, I mean, some of these houses, you could walk up to them, take a bar, go to the side of the house, pull the siding off a bit, open up the ply, so they're built so weak, they have no strength. And another thing is the modern house can shoot right through the walls. They, they don't bullets don't don't get stopped. Um, that's one edge to the old the old style Latin plaster walls is they would have stopped a bullet. Same with cob walls, more like the top of a bullet or block, heavy wood. But um, you get uh, one one piece of plyboard and one piece of uh, sheet rock. I don't stop a bullet. And if someone starts shooting at your house, you. you you could both get hit from outside right through the wall. Um, so that's why I've always thought I don't like the modern houses. They're they're built to uh, they're not very well defendable. I mean, you could you could you could sturdy them up, I guess. But it, it, you'd have to you have to put plates, metal plates, or heavy wood to stop the bullets. I had a um, house before our house burned out. I, I had this one's pretty much defendable. I had all the the windows with um, oak shutters and I had heavy oak doors. I built one inch oak and heavy hinge I put heavy metal hinges on. Made it so that if anybody tried to get in my house, they'd have a hard time getting in. I mean for me the one of the first lines of defense is, is make it to make the house secure. Uh, windows and doors. 
and also keep in mind that um you need to also keep in mind that uh you should make it so that you can see around the house like don't leave too many places that are blind spots, blind spots. try to make it so you can see what's going on out there from your position uh, we had uh i never tried cameras don't kind of like i don't like the modern uh um I, cameras is a little modern for me, but um, the way I had done is I put little. Uh, I make I make a, a sight hole in the in the shutter so I can see out. But I feel I feel better when I can sit in my house and know that someone can't just shoot me from a distance right through the window. When you're sitting there at night, you know, in your rocking chair on your couch, and someone can see through the window and snipe you off. I, I don't like that idea. I feel better when I can shut. I can shut that shutter, and I know you know they can't see in my house. I can sit in peace and know that if anybody's out there, if they want to get into my house, I have to knock on the door. If they knock on the door, they, then I'll know they're there. Because you know the thing is, in most houses, like I said, you can come up to them and get right in them real quick. I mean, you wouldn't have time to get out of bed; they'd already be in your house. But if you do your, if you make your house harder to get into they'll have to work to get in by that time you can get out of bed you can at least get yourself up pick your gun up you know assess the situation look what's going on where if your house isn't made to be uh they can break right in you're in bed they walk right in on <coughs> those um uh, the log cabins they used to build the uh the log cabins to be defended too Heavy door, bar, bar it, and then a lot of a lot of the pioneers used to build the cellar under the cabin. In that way, that if there was, if the cabin burned down on them, they would they could they could go into the cellar underneath. Oh yeah, that, that story. In Pennsylvania, there was an Amish family that uh, in the North Kill settlement back when the Indian raids were going on, they had uh, the Indians raided, burned a bunch of the cabins down, and. There was this family that got into the cellar under the cabin. Uh, they thought the Indians were gone, but there was one brave that stayed back. He was eating peaches off one of their trees. And he saw them and yelled and called them back, called the uh, Indians back, and they captured them, killed the women, took the men. And that was the story of John Holstetler. He was he was uh, taken out, out west of the Indians, and he lived there for a few years before he escaped. And they said, when he come back, when he came back from the Indians, they they, they barely knew he was, he was an Indian. He looked so uh, he looked so rough. He had he had uh, adapted to living in the woods, and uh, they said they had plucked all his hair out, so he had no no beard. The Indians had plucked all his hair out, and he uh, he actually made a raft and sailed down the Ohio. And he was so weak by the time he got down there, he could barely raise his hand when he passed the fort. But they found him. That was they called I was calling him Indian John. John Holstetler. That was the story of the first Amish families in the North Kill Settlement. And I think both boys made it back. I'm not sure what happened to the father, but uh, the boys both made it back to society later after they've been captured. And the reason they said the Indians killed the women is because the day before, some of the Indians had stopped in and wanted some food, and she'd refused to give them some food. That made them mad at her. <clears throat> so they decided because she hadn't fed them that they were gonna, you know, get rid of her. Um, I guess that that's 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 one reason I think the Bible says we should uh, feed. If we, if we feed our enemies, we probably it, it pays off in the end to feed to feed your enemies. If you can't if you can't beat them, you just feed them. That way they'll. Build up trust so you can poison them later. Oh, come on now. Don't do that. No, if you feed your enemies, you probably might be better off than not feeding. Um, I mean, yeah, it was uh, – I mean, today we have we have life a lot easier than it used to be. I think we forget how trying times could get, how quick how quick they could get going too. I mean, right now, it wouldn't take much – Put this country right back into. Uh oh, it'd probably it'd be worse than the Middle Ages, probably. Nobody has the strength to tell. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people would be, 
looking for food. A lot of people be looking for stuff. And it's, yeah, I, I think it's going to be a, one of the best things to do is you're in the city, get out of the city. Um, try to stay in more rural areas. That way it's been maybe not as much, uh, not as high a chance you're going to be overrun by people who keep knocking at your door. I mean, you want to help people the best you can. Uh, but the thing is, you, there's, there's to an extent you can't, you can't feed everybody. And there has to be a, maybe you can try to have a little bit of something for them, but you, you cannot feed everybody. It just is not possible unless, you, unless you're really rich and have a lot of money, which I know I don't have. So I made our main responsibility is to feed our families, to help, help our neighbors. And I think if we do that, we'll be um, better prepared for our times. But I say the best thing to do is keep in mind when uh, Joseph was in Egypt and the, the Pharaoh had the dream of the thin cows and the thin ears of corn. And then he, the dream is interpreted there'd be a seven years of famine. Um, I always thought, you know, food is a powerful, if powerful item. And the Egyptians first gave their money, then they gave their animals, then they gave their land, and then they gave themselves all for food. So having food is an is a important, important thing in life to stay alive. Without food and water, we, we well, shelter is important too, but I think without, a shelter without food is <coughs> not very, not the best situation. Got a nice house, but you're starving. <laughs> yeah, I would say, uh, for me, try to store rice, wheat, beans, um, oatmeal, you know, items you can use in bulk that are going to last a while. Make sure to keep the bugs out of them. Um, I never bought mylar bags. So I, can't, I, I couldn't afford them. I just used the regular buckets and then put, like I said, I burn, burn some paper and close the lid. Um, I found that to be effective. If, if the people who were on when I first started, that's what I do. Or you can use dry ice, put a piece of dry ice in and close the lid. It keeps the oxygen out so the bugs don't grow or can't grow, can't hatch out. But anyone else, any questions? Uh, let's see what we got. Well, I don't see any questions. That boy made me some coffee. That can be a barter item, too. What's that? That can be a barter item, too. Coffee? Oh, <laughs> yeah. You should buy the coffee because you can't, you, can't, you can't grow coffee up in the north very well. I've heard people say they make coffee out of chicory roots. Never tried it, but... Um, I suppose it would probably work as a substitute. I think, well, wait, I say I never tried it. I've had it before. But I've never tried making it myself. Um, didn't have caffeine in it, so it wasn't, it wasn't quite the same as real coffee. Despite the fact it tastes, tasted like coffee a little bit, it didn't have the same um, effect as coffee. Um, I don't personally know any northern, northern crops are like coffee beans. There might be something out there that I don't know about. They always say that... Uh, Instant coffee will last for almost ever. I mean, it doesn't go bad. You can store it forever. I've been trolling that coffee, unfortunately. Oh, I've missed it. <laughs> but I've done it before. I mean, I've, I've gone these little periods where I've decided not to drink. And I, I, can, I can live. It's just I, I do like coffee. I probably drink. Well, how much do I drink every day? Make at least two, pots. two pots a day, maybe two pans. So I, I do drink a good amount of coffee, but I could probably survive. I think uh, herbal teas, some kinds of herbal teas, are really good too. Um, peppermint, peppermint is one thing that I, I think is nice to have. <clears throat> we got a variety of peppermint here. It's called black stem. And it's it's it has the highest amount of oil in like in the plant as any other peppermint I've ever seen. And the, the comparison or the difference between that peppermint and the normal peppermint, it's amazing. I mean, you can make tea out of the one peppermint, and it's 
it's okay. But you make a tea out of black stem peppermint, it is, you can really tell the difference in, in the, the oil and the flavor. It's a lot stronger. Yeah, if anybody wants some of that, they got to come visit me some roots. Um, Delicious white peppermint oil, too, to stock. Oh, yeah. See, like for me, I use peppermint oil on my cuts. Whenever I have cuts or um, scrapes, burns, it's light burns. I use on it on me and the children, and it, it works really good. And that's pretty much all I've ever used for years now is peppermint oil. Um, didn't put anything else on them. Occasionally, I use peroxide if it's really bad, but using peppermint oil is good enough to keep all infection out of a cut. Um, so you just put it right on the cut. And it's one of the most, for me, it's been the most effective anti. Uh, I just keep a small bottle, get a cut or a scrape, put the peppermint oil on it a couple times, and you're good to go. No infection. And it's. Uh, it's a really effective uh, thing for. This is the brand you like. Like it. I like this brand here. This is a 16 ounce bottle of it too. It's, and now it's, it's running, it's it's running around fifty dollars on Amazon right now. That was a cheaper brand, but it seemed to be better than some of the other ones. It was stronger. It wasn't cut. You, know, you got to be careful when you buy oils. A lot of times it will say 100 percent pure. But they cut them with either mineral oil or vegetable or something. It's not pure. But when you buy now brand, the now brand oils, they're they're uh, pure for the most part, as far as I know. See the clove oil. This is what I use for uh, toothache, toothache and or tooth infections. And if I didn't have clove oil, my I, I'd have some serious issues because when I have uh, my teeth get hurt or something, I if I didn't have a clove oil backup. Yeah, so two things to buy for your survival preparedness is a bottle of peppermint oil, a bottle of clove oil. Clove oil is good for infection in the teeth. Um, it's good for uh, gum, sore gums. And then peppermint is about good for everything else, pretty much everything. I mean, it's good for cuts, bruises, scrapes, light burns. Cold sores. Well, my wife says cold sores. I never, I don't think I got any cold sores, but she has, so I suppose she knows. Um, well, there's no more questions. I'm not seeing any. Any tools you would recommend people have? Tools? Hard times? Oh, there's all kinds of tools people should have on hand. <laughs> like, what are the top five? You top five? I'd say an axe. Yeah. An axe, a file, a knife. A saw. Yeah, and you probably want you probably want to make sure you got a way to start a fire. I mean, lighters will last a long time, but um, you can use a magnifying glass and charge the fire. <laughs> if it's sunny out, yeah, it watches if it's sunny out. You remind me of that. You can use your glasses. You got magnifying glasses. Well, yeah, my glasses. My glasses would probably work if I had to, but I've never made a fire with my glasses before. I'm not saying I couldn't, though. Yeah, I don't like glasses, but I'm nearsighted, so I can't see far off. I don't have them on. He <clears throat> said other items slash ideas to prepare for hard times. Yeah. I'd say there's two things you can't really get really easy, and that's uh, files and saws, saw blades. Uh, those are two things you can't make that easy. If you got a forge, you can make a lot of stuff. You can make almost all the tools, but it's hard to make a saw, and it's hard to make a file. I don't know if you could even make a file very well because the, the way they're made, they're made uh, with a, a hard steel. It would take quite a bit of effort to make something that would be effective enough to sharpen stuff. Um, I would say stock files, saw blades. And I, I like to figure out a way to, to make my uh, own material, but so far I haven't got that far. I just, you gotta get sheep best anywhere. Well, anything. or you can grow, grow uh, flax. Now, I've never done flax myself. I'd like to try it sometime. Flax is 
would be a material you could grow the, the flax plants for linen. But you know, I've never done that before, and I, I, I mean, I mean, I'm interested in learning. It'd be, it'd be interesting to know how, how to do your own linen. Um, I used to I sheared sheep a lot over the years, and I've tried my hand at spinning. I was never that good at it, but um, I think if you had to, you, you'd have plenty of time on your hands. You could spin yourself. Tanning hides is not you can use for clothing. And again, that takes salt and alum, stock alum powder, so that you can tan. Oh, another thing I would say is uh, keep on hand uh, is uh, blue coat for, for animals, for the for the, uh, for the wounds on animals. And it works for people too, but for animals, it's a really effective, effective thing. And then also, I would say hydrogen peroxide, but keep it, try to find the, the, the high grade hydrogen peroxide because that you can clean you can purify water with it you just you, if you put it in water it will it will it will purify it you can uh, clean clean out wounds with it deep wounds it's, it's one of the best cleaners for that and it helps to sanitize you know when you're when you're working on a wound also you sanitize the items. Themselves so they don't get well, well, with tetanus, you want to make sure the wound heals from the inside out, not from the outside in. So what I always do with, like I said, I stepped on a rusty nail. I take a, a syringe with with either high percent peroxide or clove oil and just shoot it into the poke and make sure that I kept that. Um, okay, it opened until it healed from the inside out, because if you let it heal from the outside first and then the, that's where tetanus starts. So if you just make sure you keep it. The, the, that it heals from inside out into the outside in, and that on on a wound on a, a poke wound like uh, the nail, I try not to use peppermint oil because peppermint oil, peppermint oil always heals the outside first, and with clove oil, if you, if you took a needle and shot into the wound, a lot of times it would it would it make it so it would heal from the inside out and not from the outside in. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I advise if you get a poke wound, make sure you, you work on it from the inside out, and when you want tetanus. It won't get that angry, uh, likely. I know. I know some people said uh, pack it with garlic. I've never actually tried get the garlic pack. Um, I've used uh, on my horses. If I had bad wounds on horses, one of the ways I found to, to, to cure it was to take uh, hydrated lime, and you just you pack the wound full of the hydrated lime. Um, pack it full of hydrated lime. And then put lard or fat around the edge to keep it from drying out. And I had horses that had really deep wounds heal up completely uh, using just hydrated lime. And it, and it, 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 it was it was one way that I um, was able to heal some of the worst injuries on horses I've had. And very, it's it's not expensive. And it's quite effective. Well, I just have a problem with phone. Let's see. Oops. Well, this that might not work. Really. Huh. All right. Yeah, the uh, yeah. So keep yourself keep, keep a, a bag of lime, a bottle of peroxide, or some peroxide, and peppermint oil, clove oil, and keep red pepper on hand. Cayenne pepper uh, for bleeding. Cayenne pepper when it's fresh. Now keep in mind that pepper's got to be fresh. If you let it get old, it doesn't work well. I've tried different different types with old pepper on wounds, and it didn't stop bleeding well. But if you have a a fresh cayenne pepper that's you know a year or two old, it's very effective in stopping bleeding on almost any cut. You can uh, you can have really bad cuts. Pack that pepper in there, and bleeding will stop almost immediately. <coughs> Excuse me. That's if it's fresh. Um, See, so yeah, I keep some cayenne pepper on hand. Um, for stomach, uh, I've always found that if I if I'm having stomach issues, you can either use uh, depends on the bacteria, but one of the most effective things I found up in diarrhea was salt. And just just drink a bunch of water, and then take a spoon of salt. Don't eat any food. It should clear up almost right away if it's the right kind of if the right if it's a certain kind of bacteria. Because in Belize we had a and in Ohio I had issues where once while you eat something you know, it could be messed up. 
take a little salt. And they, you got to remember, salt can hurt your kidneys. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but uh, it was an effective way to cure that. Oh, I like to keep ivermectin on hand too for warmer. Keep that. Uh, I've used ivermectin as warmer for ivermectin. That's why I usually use. I use it on my horses too, but I don't. I don't shoot it into the muscle with the horses. With the horses, you'll just want to put it in the syringe and shoot it into their mouths. Because they say if you put you put that uh, needle into the horses, some horses will have a reaction. So don't don't shoot it into the horse's muscle. With cows, pigs, and sheep, you can put it into the muscle. And then with the horses, dogs, and cats, I just put it in the mouths. Um, it's effective against round worms, pin worms, long worms, and I think hook worms too, some blood worms. But, uh, and for me, I found it really effective just to take about a, use about a cc or one millimeter per hundred pounds, and it will keep it will keep the worms out of you. That's one thing. Yeah, keep, keep a bottle of ivermectin too. That stuff is a good, very effective against most worms. Uh, tapeworms. Um, tapeworms. I don't know if I've ever had tapeworms, but I've had I've had an animal to get them, and they can really wreak havoc on animals. <laughs> I did, didn't you, yeah, my my wife's dad had a tapeworm once. How did he kill it? You know. I don't remember. He tried to pull it out. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem to kill tapeworms. I'm not sure why. I guess it's the type of worm they are. But um, yeah. So if keep that keep that in your storage too. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to get too filled with the books. I like, I like this book here. Yeah, this I like this book here. Back to basics. I know it's it's got some things in it that are helpful for. Yeah, we should have a book on herbal remedies. Yeah, okay. it's not it's not as um, it's not as detailed. Acorns. Well, I've never tried coffee from acorns. So we, we don't have it. Well, we've got one oak tree in our place. I don't know if it, I've actually never seen acorns on it, to be honest. I don't know if our acorn trees, uh, for some reason, I've never seen acorn down there, and I don't know. Well, <laughs> it's the only tree there. Maybe that's what it is. Sometimes certain kinds of trees got to have more than one tree to pollinate. I've seen uh, <coughs> like mulberries, and I don't. we don't have mulberries here, but there were... Um, I thought it interesting that some mulberry trees were female mulberry trees and some were male or male flowers. They didn't have any female fruit. They wouldn't bear any fruit. They would just bear male, male, male flowers. And the other trees had male and female flowers. So that was interesting, you, you, the mulberry trees, for that matter. And you, you didn't know when you planted a seed which, uh, which tree you'd get. But mulberry, you can take a piece of the stick, cut it off, and put it in some uh, nice wet soil, and that'll root in and start a new tree. So you can you can start mulberry from a, 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 a stick cutting pretty easy. They're, they're, yeah, they're about the same as willows. Not quite as easy as willows, but they were pretty good. <coughs> no. Well, you guys all take care. And if you have any more questions, just put them in the bottom of the chat. I'm going to let you all go for now. And thanks for stopping and watch, watching. And, What's that? <laughs> Take care.